Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session this afternoon. Um, today, we're thrilled to have Chris Fonsbeck, who is from the uh, Vanderbilt University Department of Biostats. Uh, he's the benevolent dictator for life of PyMC3, a package I use a lot, and it's, a, it's, it's for Bayesian statistical modeling and the likes. Um, and so he's here to talk about Bayesian non-parametric models, which actually ironically means infinite number of parameters. And we're going to hear him tell, tell us about that stuff. Thank you. Chris, please come on. You spoiled everything, Eric. That was my punchline. OK. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, there are competing PyMC talks in this time slot. So um, uh, Colin Carroll is, is, is talking about some applications. Um, I'm glad you joined me here. I heard his have nice pictures of puppies and such. Um, but uh, I, hopefully, I will uh, 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 give you something to think about here as well. So. Um, let me just adjust my display a little bit. Sorry about that. There we go. All right, so yeah, PyMC3 is a, a library programming, a probabilistic programming library for Python that I uh, help to develop. Um, Eric does too. and. Um, uh, it is a very specific application for um, doing um, statistical and probabilistic uh, machine learning. I'm going to today talk about one very specific subset of that. Um, and so, you know, PyCon is one of the useful things about PyCon talks is that uh, it can be used for kind of stocking your, your toolbox and uh, exposing sort of maybe less known capabilities of packages. And so that's kind of what I'm intending to do here. Um, and what I'm going to focus on, as my name, the, the name of the talk implies, is uh, one particular uh, non-parametric Bayesian model. And I'll explain what non-parametric Bayesian models are in a second. Uh, I realize in the abstract it claims to be presenting two of these uh, methods. But um, as I finished the Gaussian process part of things, I was already up to 60 slides. So uh, I think we're going to have more than enough to, uh, to chew on here. Um, but just to motivate um, this application. Um, I, th this should sort of be motivated by the fact that uh, data are, are messy, as we all know. And, and there's different ways of being messy, right? I'm not really talking about kind of missing values or unstructuredness or uh, incorrect values. Um, I'm talking more about the, the underlying generating models that uh, create the data that we observe. And so the, the data that we often see in uh, documentation and examples and uh, textbooks are usually uh, nice and neat, right? So this actually comes from a textbook. It's you know a, a linear regression type of a model. And, and of course, the, the points all lie more or less along that straight line. Um, but of course, you know, nature is different than that, right? The data that we often get uh, look more like uh, more like this. So these are just sort of arbitrarily uh, drawn examples from stuff that I work on. So three of these are baseball data sets. The one in the top, the purple one in the top uh, left side is uh, player value as a function of signing age. Uh, the big distribution on the other top corner are actually um, Boston Marathon finishing times uh, and so on. And, and of course, you know, straight lines don't really fit through uh, these guys very well. Um, you know, they're sort of mixtures of different processes um, and um, applying some of these sort of default behaviors as we often do when we build models uh, won't, won't work all that well. And um, the default statistical assumptions that we're usually relying on are ones like this. So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with statistical modeling, this is just a simple linear regression, right? So predicting y as a function of x, and there's a slope beta 1 and an intercept beta naught, and there's some error epsilon. And so this, this implies a straight line, a straight line relationship. And moreover, the, the, uh, uh, the error is normally distributed. It's a nice bell curve. And, and um, <clears throat> so these assumptions of parametric distributions for data, and wh what I'm going to focus on more here today is the linear relationships among variables 
um, um, is often inappropriate. So here's a, you know, an example that I'll talk a little bit about later. This is a, a, a small data set of uh, salmon spawning. So along the x-axis are spawners, or female salmon, and then the recruits are the, the fry, the young salmon are on the x-axis, and that's on a log scale. And you, know, you could fit these, uh, this is just using a linear regression, and, and you might get a decent you know, correlation with this, but obviously it's a wrong model. You'll make some, there'll be some problems if you try to use this for anything. It overpredicts in some areas and underpredicts in others. And of course, we could, you know, fit these using traditional nonlinear methods like polynomials and things like that, uh, but it's a little bit more cumbersome. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit, something that's a little more automated, a little more flexible. And um, the approach that I'm going to discuss uses Bayesian methods. Um, which is you know, a fancy word really for, for probabilistic programming. And what Bayesian uh, methods do, uh, for those of you unfamiliar, is that it allows us to make uh, inferences and predictions about things that we care about uh, using probabilities, essentially. So my sort of two minute Bayes intro, this is Bayes formula. I'm not gonna have a lot of equations in this talk. The ones that I do have are simply illustrative. Um, so this is, this is Bayes formula, and what it does is it tells us something about unknown things that we care about, we're gonna call these theta, based on things we observe, i.e. data, and this is y. So the thing on the far left is something we call a posterior distribution. It's what we know about theta after having observed y. And uh, we get that, the, the way that Bayes' formula is magical is it gives, that, gives us that using quantities that we have in hand, i.e information about our unknowns before we look at our data, we call this the prior, and then our, we integrate our data using a particular type of probability distribution called a likelihood function. And uh, that um, symbol that's linking these two components is a proportional to sign, so they're equal to up to a constant. Okay, that's all you really need to know about Bayes uh, here. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, the method that I'm going to show off is, is a method for modeling complex nonlinear functions using Gaussian distributions, normal distributions. So uh, most of us probably remember from our undergraduate or graduate statistics class, normal distributions a very uh, particular statistical distribution. Uh, it's, it, it's symmetric. It has... Uh, most of its observations within two standard deviations of the mean. It seems like an unlikely candidate for modeling messy data. It seems like a very, very uh, structured, uh, limited uh, probability distribution. But there are a couple of properties of normal distributions that are very helpful in this context. And there are two in particular. Uh, one is something known as the conditioning property. The idea here is that uh, the con if you have a multivariate normal distribution, the conditional distribution of some elements of that data, conditional on the rest of them, is also normal. So the only reason I'm showing this equation here is that this is the conditional normal. So the things, the mean and the, and the covariance there, are things that can be calculated in closed form, right? You don't have to do any numerical approximation, you can write it down on a piece of paper, and that's very handy. Relatedly, uh, the other useful property is the marginalization property. And this, all, this says that the marginal distribution of some of the elements of your multivariate normal is also normally distributed. So if we have a big multivariate normal and we call one subset of them X and the other subset Y, the, uh, if you integrate out Y, you don't actually have to do that integration. Nobody likes to do integration. You just have to pop in the, the marginal, the, the mu X, for the mean and sigma x for the covariance and you're, you're done, you can walk away, you don't have to worry about anything else. So well, what this allows us to do is build a model called a Gaussian process and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. You can think of a Gaussian process as a generalization of a normal distribution. So rather than being a distribution over values, so here y are some values that we observe, we're talking about here a distribution over functions. So a realization of a Gaussian process is a function and that's a little bit different. You can think of a function as being a, a generalization of like a lookup table, right? So rather than indexing individual elements out with index values, you can give arbitrary uh, arguments and get some value back. So what is a Gaussian process? Well, the formal definition is this, an infinite connect co collection of random variables, any finite subset of which has a Gaussian distribution. 
Well, that doesn't sound like a very helpful uh, or useful definition, but it does illustrate how we can work with them. So uh, as Eric pointed out in the introduction, um, we call this non-parametric uh, methods, but what, what's all this business then of an infinite number of parameters? Well, non-parametric is a bit of a misnomer. We actually do mean an infinite number of parameters, or a better way of thinking of it is that the number of parameters the end of using scales with the size of the data, and that's what we want. If you don't have much data, you shouldn't be using very many parameters in your model. If you have lots of data, you should be using more parameters, and this is what Gaussian processes allows us to do. So, um, and what, it, what we're doing here is we're actually modeling the underlying function directly, and that's how it's useful for complex nonlinear stuff, right? So if you, can th you think about uh, what a, a regular normal distribution does, or, or say a regular linear regression does, it models that function indirectly via those parameters, beta and beta naught, beta one and beta naught. Here we're, we're, we're essentially modeling the functions uh, directly. Um, and uh, the, the meat of the Gaussian process, the thing that makes it go, the engine is a better analogy, is the covariance function. So rather than having a covariance matrix like you'd have in a normal distribution, we have a covariance function that generates covariance matrices as we give it arguments. And what this does is that the, the covariance matrix essentially ensures that values close together in the input space will produce output values that are also close together. And so the art in doing Gaussian processes is choosing the appropriate covariance function. So if you have sort of smoothly varying functions that you're trying to model, you might pick something like a quadratic. And so the, sample, the uh, plot at the bottom are simply realizations from a, a Gaussian process prior with a quadratic uh, covariance function. If you need something a little bit more jagged, uh, changing a little faster uh, as, with distance, uh, a matern is a little bit more flexible. And there's a whole suite of them. Um, I'm only going to show you three here. There's a cosine, so you have periodic stuff perhaps going on inside of your Gaussian process. You can use a cosine covariance function, etc. There is also a mean function, so just like a normal distribution is parameterized by a mean and a covariance matrix, uh, the Gaussian process is fully specified by a covariance function and a mean function. It turns out the mean function is not very interesting. Um, it's essentially used to uh, uh, provide kind of a prior guess at what the underlying function might look like if you have that kind of information. But it, and, it, and it turns out that it doesn't have a lot of influence on the posterior once you add some data to it. So you can usually specify it as a zero or a constant or maybe a linear function. I'll show you one with a linear function later on. So to kind of give you a visual sense of what GPs look like, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here is sort of piece by piece draw a sample from a prior Gaussian process. So this particular prior GP has a mean of zero and a quadratic, uh, uh, quadratic exponential uh, covariance function with parameter one. And so it kind of looks like this. So we're really just specifying the range of values that, uh, that the function could take. And so it should bounce around inside of that interval with a mean on that red line. And so we can draw, let's say, one point from one of these functions. And so all we have to do here is draw a normal. There's no covariance now because this is the first point that's being drawn. So I can do that in Python. And then conditional on that point, I can draw others. So here's my second point. And you see what happens here. We're making kind of link sausages, right? So as you get farther away from the point, it starts returning to its prior. But we have a lot of information near the point and because they have covary, uh, it, it becomes closer to that value. We don't have to do this one at a time. The only reason I'm sampling them separately at all is to kind of, again, give you an idea. So let's take four or five more points, and, um, and what we're starting to see here is a function, right? If I kept taking points, I would get more or less continuous function. And if I reset my, or picked a different random number uh, seed at the beginning, and I did a few of these, I would get a whole bunch of different samples. So these are draws from the prior. And notice that these all kind of bounce around with mean zero and within sort of a standard deviation or two from that, from that mean. There's no data here, all right? These are prior processes and we'll convert these into posteriors functions once we've seen some data. Doing that is a little tricky and uh, it's hard to do manually. So this is where uh, you wanna look for a third party package. Um, Happily, there are many, many ways of fitting GPs in Python. Uh, lots of packages allow for this now. Uh, GPy and GPflow from the folks at the University of Sheffield is one of the best uh, 
ones out there, one of the ones that's been around the longest. You can do them in scikit-learn. They're not quite as Bayesian as in some other uh, implementations, but they're very good, particularly the new ones. Um, there's the three old men, Stan, Edward, and George. Uh, they all do them uh, with varying degrees of, of uh, automation. And then PyMC3, which I'm going to talk about here. Um, so PyMC3, just a quick intro. I, I started this way back in 2003 when I was a postdoc. And um, it's, a, it's a probabilistic programming framework for, again, vi fitting a variety of, of probability models using um, what, what I would call next generation Bayesian inference methods. So we're talking um, gradient-based Markov chain Monte Carlo and variational inference uh, primarily. Uh, it's currently based on Theano, which uh, some of you may have heard has, has essentially uh, shut its doors. And so we'll be looking to shift um, uh, PyMC over to a new backend in the coming months and years, um, most likely TensorFlow, so stay tuned for information uh, on that. So um, I want to motivate the, the, the PyMC Gaussian processes with some real-world examples. Um, I already showed you this salmon recruitment data set um, that looks like this. And so how do we fit a GP to this? Well, if we go back to a Bayes formula, remember, posterior likelihood prior, um, our prior is going to be a GP prior, like the one that I was constructing using the covariance function that I drew values from. Our data, in this case, is going to be Gaussian uh, because it's a lo I've log transformed the data. And then what I'm going to get out the other end is a closed form Gaussian process, closed form. Like We don't have to really do any numerical computation. You start with a GP, you give it normal data, you get a Gaussian process back. Normal, normal, normal. Um, so here's what it looks like. This is what PyMC code looks like. So it uses a uh, 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 context manager to uh, construct the model. So you declare, you, you instantiate a model object, give it a name. And um, what I'm doing here is I'm specifying the hyperparameters for a quadratic exponential. Um, so rho and eta here are actually very interpretable hyperparameters. Eta is the signal variance along the y. And rho is the length scale that kind of stretches things to see how far uh, uh, observations have to go before they become very different. And, and this is the, again, the exponential, quadratic exponential um, covariance function. So here's the covariance function. So um, um, I'm going to, oh, there's a mean function and a covariance function here. So m is one of those um, sort of throwaway uh, functions. This time I'm going to use a linear uh, model here because, you know, you might, have some prior knowledge about salmon growth. You, you think it goes up like this, and so I'm just taking the rise over the run of the data and supplying that as the coefficient. Again, kind of a prior guess. We don't really expect it to look like that when we're done, but it's a good place to start. And then uh, the second line is the, is the uh, quadratic exponential covariance function that's parameterized by rho. And then I, I construct a marginal Gaussian process. So that's the marginal GP. Um, and, um, and then the data, so then we bring in the data. So that was the prior, here's the data. So we use what's called the marginal likelihood and we pass it X and Y, the spawners and the recruits. And then we allow for a little bit of observation noise, right? differences between the expected value and, and what you actually observe. And all we have to do here is optimize. We actually don't have to do any, again, fancy numerical stuff. I'm just gonna optimize the values of those parameters. Um, and one of the nice things about using Bayesian methods is that it's a really elegant way of making predictions once you've got your model. You kind of get your predictions uh, for free. And uh, what we use for that is something called the posterior predictive distribution, which kind of looks ugly. Anything with an integral looks you know, unfriendly from the start. Um, but what we're doing here is essentially we're incorporating the information that we have about our process using the posterior distribution about theta, and then also the randomness, the uncertainty having to do with just kind of random sampling of our data. And so we're able to make predictions about new things, why new, given stuff that we've seen and used to fit our data. So, and in this case with a GP, we're actually just going to be drawing from a normal distribution again. We're going to have a new mu and sigma based on uh, what we use to fit our data. And in PyMC, this is just a couple of lines. I specify a grid of values, or in this case, a range of values over x. I create a conditional Gaussian process uh, uh, to sample from, and then I just draw samples. So sample PPC is just drawing samples from that value. And I'm just going to take three. So here are three candidate values for the underlying function. Again, 
realizations of GPs are functions. So it's not a single value, it's a continuous function. And so that's three of them. And you can see that they kind of vary a little bit, particularly towards the end of the time series. Um, and if um, th those particular samples were drawn without observation noise, there's a little switch there, so the pred noise argument in the first line uh, can turn on and off prediction noise using that sigma. And so here I'm going to draw a thousand samples to give a better idea of kind of the range of values, and we can plot those. And so now you can see kind of a, a reasonable estimate uh, of that function with kind of uncertainty bounds. And that's one of the nice things about a Bayesian inference is that everything is in terms of probabilities, and so you always have a, uh, a pretty honest um, uh, evaluation of the uncertainty associated with your estimates when you're done. And again, we could have used a polynomial to fit this, maybe even a quadratic, but there we would have had to do a lot of work thinking about what, you know, what, what, how exactly to parameterize this. With the GP, the truth is in there somewhere. You just have to pull it out uh, using your data. Another couple of examples. So what about when we don't have normal data, right? It's, it's easy if you've got normal, normal, normal. Uh, well, uh, we often get data that are not normally distributed. Uh, this is an example that uh, we use um, in one of our uh, example scripts in, in the PyMC code base. Here I'm going to use it a little bit differently. This is a uh, time series of historical coal mining disasters in Britain from, what, 1851 to 1961. And um, typically we treat this with, in, at least in our example, as kind of a switch point analysis. We say that there's a constant mean at the beginning, and then something changes, and then it becomes lower. Some sort of safety uh, provisions kicked in, perhaps, in the middle of the time series. Now I'm going to use a GP for this to do it a little bit more flexibly. So now, this is what Bayes' formula looks like for this GP. I've got a Gaussian process prior like before, but now my data is going to be Poisson distributed. And Poisson is another distribution for discrete values that are typically used to mod model counts. That's the reason I'm choosing it here. And then out the other end, I have a transformed Gaussian process. I have to transform it now because it's not normal anymore. And so the model looks more or less the same. Um, so we set it up exactly the same. I'm using a quadratic exponential, and I'm just going to highlight what's different, and it's just these two lines here. Now what I'm using is something called a latent Gaussian process, because I'm modeling that latent mean, the mean that you never observe. You can't observe a mean, right? You can't observe a rate. It's something that you infer. And, and then I'm going to create a prior for that, based on the data that, that I've observed. And then um, I can add a, a Poisson likelihood. Now, this is done in exactly the same way it would be done for any model in PyMC uh, using the observed uh, flag or the observed argument to pass the data in. And then now I'm going to use MCMC. Right? I haven't got a closed form GP anymore because I'm not fully Gaussian, uh, but I'm going to uh, sample 1,000 iterations, tuning for 2,000, uh, using an MCMC sampler called NUTS, called the no-U-turn sampler. And this is a very efficient, sort of the state, current state of the art in MCMC sampling. And it's, it's the default for continuous uh, parameters in PyMC. And here's what we get. Again, a nice continuous function of the underlying mean with, um, uh, and you can see these are a 1,000 draws. So you can see kind of how, how they vary. Uh, you know, it could be, there's sort of less, it's sort of less likely to be highly variable. Um, most of them are, tend to be a, a kind of smoother functions. Okay, we're not overfitting. Here, um, it's taking the, the marginal likelihood takes into account uh, the, the uh, uh, overfitting aspect of the model, so you, you kind of get that regularization uh, automatically here. The other nice thing that you get um, with doing MCMC sampling is you get distributions for those hyperparameters. So this is the uncertainty in the true underlying value of those, uh, of those two parameters for the quadratic exponential, which is really nice. Uh, second example, um, I'm gonna, this comes from some, um, some of my own work. I, I do some epidemiological uh, research at Vanderbilt, and this is uh, from a, a reconstruction of a measles outbreak that occurred in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil in 1997. And um, this is a, a different sort of uh, messy data. It's, uh, th what happens here is that the, 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 the uh, outbreak, the measles outbreak, gets monitored uh, by recording cases as they come into clinics during the outbreak. And um, measles is kind of a febrile uh, illness that results in fever and rash. And a, a lot of um, illnesses, uh, f for young people particularly, have fever and rash, like rubella, 
uh, dengue, and they can be misdiagnosed as measles. So there's a, a misidentification of folks coming into the clinic, kids coming into the clinic, and, um, uh, and this can uh, result in a biased assessment of the age classes at risk here, and ultimately of the uh, vaccination coverage necessary to limit the outbreak. And so what we see here are values of um, cases that were confirmed versus those that were unconfirmed. And we're, so we're gonna, we wanna use this to correct uh, for the true underlying uh, number of cases in the population. So here what we have is kind of a binomial situation, right? What we're trying to estimate the bias in confirmation. So again, I'm, Age, something that varies by age, is very commonly nonlinear, and in this case, it, 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 it certainly is. So here's a confirmation model then uh, as a GP. Again, exactly the same as before, but now, rather than Poisson or Gaussian data, we have binomial data. Um, so I'm taking my uh, Gaussian process here and I'm transforming it using an inverse logit transformation, which changes it from the real line where the, where the normal distribution is defined to a zero one interval because we're modeling probabilities here. And now we have a binomial likelihood, okay? And um, the result here is quite nice because um, it's, it's a difficult problem because there are lots and lots of cases at the really young age groups. You tend to be young when you get measles. So the, the dots for the data here are proportional to the log of the uh, number of cases. And so the, the estimates the intervals around the estimates are very tight at, at, at younger ages, but then as you get into uh, uh, you know, age 50 and beyond, where very few people get measles, the uncertainty increases, but we're still able to make predictions uh, in that, in that uh, domain. So uh, it's not all happiness and sunshine with Gaussian processes. They are very powerful, uh, useful tools. I use them a lot. Um, but they are a little bit limited um, in that they don't tend to scale very well out of the box with large data sets. This is not a big data analysis tool. Um, and the problem is, and sorry, this may be your last equation, um, uh, the problem has to do with uh, this. This is the uh, formula that shows the posterior covariance function. And in particular, over here, what we have is a, essentially an x by x, a matrix of the data, uh, that we're inverting. And um, that doesn't, that's not a very fast operation. So, um, so it's, in fact, it's cubic in uh, compute time and, and uh, quadratic in memory. And so um, what we, we're not at a complete loss of what to do here. What we can do is approximate. Um, so what we're gonna do here is do what's called a sparse approximation, which uh, involves selecting a subset of the training points uh, size big M, if you like, that's, that's much smaller than big M, the size of the data. And this, um, we base our computation on that. And of course, this reduces the expressiveness of the Gaussian process. We're not, it's not gonna be as good as before, uh, but some problems simply can't even be approached uh, without, without doing this. Um, so, a quick example for this. This is uh, some data that's freely available online. It's the finishers of various uh, runnings of the Boston Marathon. I'm using the 2015 data set here. So this is 20, almost 27,000 finishers. So that matrix would be a 27,000 by 27,000 matrix. Um, uh, it's, it's not, you know, you, you can't use a, a standard GP for that. And so this is what the data looks like. And we want to estimate, you know, a mean of this. And, and again, it's not exactly a straight line. It's kind of hard to interpret here because of the density of the points. Um, but the, the GP looks Again, the implementation looks the same. The API is exactly the same, except now I'm using uh, here, you'll notice uh, the GP is a marginal sparse. So now we have to give it some approximations. And you can, you can specify the approximation uh, type. Uh, this one's called a FIT-C, a fully independent training conditional approximation. There are two others. Um, they're just different ways of doing it. Um, fit, the FIT-C can tend to underestimate the noise variance um, which I'm not too concerned about in this particular example. Some of the others will, will uh, overestimate the noise variance. Again, there's no free lunch in machine learning. Uh, if we're gonna approximate, we're gonna make a, a sacrifice somewhere, and that's where it is. But uh, it can very quickly be fit in, in PyMC. This take, took about a minute and a half to run. And again, very tight bounds here on the uncertainty because there are so many runners, but as you get you know, beyond 80 years old, there aren't as many people running marathons. Um, and so, the, you know, it's 
They're probably not going to drop back down to three-hour marathons, but you know that's how we spec that's where prior specification will will help us. And then the red points here are, are where those approximations go. And by default, it, PyMC will use k-means to 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 determine the optimal location of those uh, of those points. Um, my last example. Uh, so far, I've just talked about kind of time series. Um, applications, but of course, um, we often have multidimensional data, and um, in particular, you know, spatial analyses are quite uh, approachable using Gaussian processes. So the example I'm going to use here actually comes from a textbook, uh, but it's, it's still a pretty messy data set. This is from um, Isaacs and Srivastava's Applied Geostatistics from 1989, um, one of our, our lapsed PyMC developers from Pi, the PyMC two days. Um, used one of these in, in, in the examples um, from an earlier version. I'm going to use it here. Um, this is um, XY location, geospatial locations of essentially uh, geological samples of three different things. And they're not even identified in the, um, in the textbook. They're just substance V, substance U, substance T. Uh, two of them are, are floating point values. One of them is, is integer values. Um, so I'm going to use uh, substance V here, whatever that is. And um, these are spatial samples. So what, what looks like is happening here um, is that they, they took samples on a more or less regular grid. And then when they found sort of positive values, they did a little bit more intensive local sampling. So it's a very uneven grid. So the, the lighter, the yellower, the color, the, the higher the values of VR, uh, the purple values are essentially zeros. So how do we do this in PyMC 3 with the GP module? Um, it's very, very easy. Um, the only thing I'm changing, this is, ex well, I've changed two things here. I've used a matern covariance function. Remember the one that was slightly more jagged? Um, uh, just to allow a little bit more flexibility. It won't smooth things out as much. And then, uh, notice, now I have a two for the first argument rather than a one. I didn't explain what that was before. The one just said one dimension, essentially. Now I've got a two-dimensional GP, etc. cetera. Um, and that runs as, as usual. I can, I can optimize that. It's a sparse marginal, again, because it's a, a fairly large data set. And then uh, the conditional, what we're interested in now is like a surface, essentially, right? We're going to kind of approximate a, sur a surface. In fact, in geostatistics, th this is a well-known procedure called Krieging. You can show that Krieging is essentially a special case of Gaussian processes. And so what I've done here is I've created a, using NumPy, a, a mesh grid, a uh, regular grid over the whole area, and then I'm just running that through the conditional Gaussian process, and you get a nice uh, surface, uh, which is great. And you could get uncertainties associated with this as well, of course, because it's fully probabilistic. So, um, so there's more. There, I could have kept going, um, but we're running out of time. Uh, you can use Gaussian processes for classification, uh, something called ARD, which is essentially feature selection, automatic relevance determination. Um, you can show that, there are, that neural networks are a special case of GP, deep neural networks. Uh, you can use them for reinforcement learning, uh, lots of stuff. Um, there are advantages to using them. The reason I use them is that they're kind of a mindless way of doing, uh, mindless in a good way, of doing nonlinear regression. You don't have to really think about the underlying process, uh, but you can recover almost any arbitrary um, continuous functions using that way. It's a fully probabilistic set up, and so your, your predictions will have uncertainties associated with them. Uh, the hyperparameters are very interpretable, length scales, uh, variances, and so on. And it's very easy to automate. You can combine, I didn't show that this in, our, in our, any of the examples, but you can have a, a system that has multiple covariance functions that model different parts of the time series process or the spatial process. And of course, the limitations uh, I outlined here mostly have to do with the fact of, that they don't scale well without a little bit of, of help. Um, most of what you saw today is due to the work of, of one person, uh, Bill Engels, who last year was one of our Google Summer of Code students, and he cranked this out more or less in one summer. Extremely impressive, and he's going to do it again this summer. He's going to improve things even more, um, at, particularly on the big data side of things. So uh, we're looking forward to more there. Um, and I just want to say thanks to the uh, entire PyMC team, which includes Bill and includes Eric here. Um, and uh, for making it a, a, a tremendous community-based package now. So um, it's really worth spending a lot of time to produce good software and support it, and, and the team works very hard to do that. So I hope you will 
check out PyMC3 and the GPs um, uh, when you get the chance. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, so we're going to enter the Q&A period. Uh, just a few rules of thumb. First off, if you've got a question, please keep it short. Please keep it concise. Ask one question. Don't ask uh, two part one question. Uh, and uh, uh, don't phrase your question as a comment. All right, so with that, I'd like to take the first question from the front, and then we'll go to the back there. It's a lot of rules. OK, thank you very much for the interesting uh, introduction. But uh, actually, I'm not quite, uh, I, I don't have a quite clear idea of that about the Gaussian process, as you explained uh, earlier. I wonder, is it like uh, you try to do some uh, kernel regression using Gaussian uh, kernel, or, it, or I misunderstood it? Um, you can show that Gaussian, well, you, you can show that uh, kernel regressions, could, you can derive Gaussian processes from kernel regressions, uh -huh. but um, kind of like s splines as well, but you don't have to pre-specify the points. So okay. you're essentially modeling the whole process as an infinite dimensional problem. And because of that conditioning property, uh, uh, we're able to focus our attention on just the points that we've observed or the ones that we want to predict, and we can forget about the rest of the real line. Okay, so it's more of a generalization or? Marginalization or conditioning, depending okay. on what the operation that you're doing. I yeah. see. Also, yeah. like in terms of the infinite space, what uh, what space are you referring to? Is it like functional space, or do you refer to the functional major space? Sp yeah. Okay, functional yeah. space. Yeah. Okay, we're we're gonna stop that okay. question there. If you have further questions, please talk with Chris afterwards. Uh, back there. How does this apply to design of experiments um, for looking at the results, modeling them? Um, I'm not sure you'd use it for the design. This would be more for model-based inference. Um, so you could de design experiments that result in, say, a surface or something that is varying with some variable like age. And so this is a flexible m way of building that model. So you could have a, a um, clinical trial or something where you have uh, candidates of, or subjects of different age, uh, and you may want to model or you may want to express how some particular outcome varies as a function of age, and I'm just using that because that's commonly nonlinear. Uh, so what would, what would you think would happen if we took some uh, state-of-the-art deep learning models, these, these you know, deep convolutional neural networks that can, can sometimes have millions of parameters and reduce the uh, parametric complexity and instead replace it um, by modeling some of those parameters um, in a Bayesian fashion, what what do you think the trade-off is is there in terms of uh, the the usefulness of the model? Uh, well, anytime you're going into a Bayesian context, you're worried about uncertainty, and so um, there are some good examples in in uh, on the PyMC docs about um, uh, Bayesian deep neural networks where you uh, assign priors to the weights in the neural network, and, um, and so you can get uncertainty about your predictions, and that's where it would cross over. There are deep Gaussian processes that are used, uh, particularly in the reinforcement learning space, and so they, those worlds do intersect a little bit. Um, you're never quite leaving the parametric space, um, but sometimes you are interested in interpreting some of those, and, and so we hold on to them. All right, any other questions back there? Um, the Pi MC, that MC stands for Monte Carlo or Markov chain. And the second question is, any change to update the model based on the new data point that I've observed? Based on the new what, sorry? The new data that I've observed. Uh, uh, how how to update the model? Oh, oh, I see. So after you fit the model, update it with new observations? Yeah, so uh, first part of the question, what does the MC stand for? I guess it could be a, either when I... Uh, I, I thought about calling it Pi MC MC, but it sounded a little awkward, so Pi MC. Mm -hmm. So it can be MC or MC. Um, <laughs> updating a Bayesian model, that's a tricky question. Um, you know, with, with a Gaussian process, it's great because you can, you can take that posterior and make it the prior the next time and add more data to it. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, so you could do that. You, you, there isn't an automated way of doing that in Pi MC right now because you build this static graph ends up being a Theano graph, and, and so you would have to manually take your posterior from one model and add it, and, and add it as a prior for your next model. Um, but in principle, you can do it, and that's really the power, one of the powerful things about Bayes is that you can keep turning the Bayesian crank and learning, learn more and more about it. Uh, but you would have to take those posteriors and turn them back into priors again 
So in this case, the I'm sorry, we're going to leave it as for fairness for other people who would like to ask questions. Uh, next, please. Hi, uh, I might have missed this, but um, is it possible to use this method to model multiple outputs, like multiple dimensions? Uh, right, yeah, oh, mul mul yeah. Um, in principle, yes, but you, not in, not in PyMC right now. You're talking about a, a multivariate output, so where y, y is multivariate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, in principle you can, but it's, you'd have to do it by hand in PyMC. Okay. And it wouldn't be easy. Thank you. Yeah. Next question back there. For PyMC, when you're computing the inverse of the matrix, are there other numerical methods implemented that you would typically see in like partial differential equations? So um, decomps? Yeah, we have different decomps. Um, we have uh, Cholesky decompositions, and um, I can't remember the name of the other one. Do you remember the name of the other decomposition that it uses? Um, LJK decomposition. Um, so that, that's where I think a lot of the research this summer is going to go to making those faster and, um, and, and possibly leveraging stuff in, in the future TensorFlow uh, for, for, for doing some of that more efficiently and perhaps using the GPU. Thank you. Next question. Uh, can PyMC be used, uh, can the Gaussian process be used for heteroscedastic errors? Yeah, you just have to, uh, so the noise that I was passing in there was a sigma, a scalar sigma, so a diagonal covariance matrix, and you can certainly make it um, uh, more structured than that, yes, by passing in a matrix rather than a scalar value. Thanks. All right, do we have any other questions? Going once, going twice, sold. All right, thank you, Chris, for a great talk. Thanks a lot, everybody. Talk.